Hey everybody, Jem Schofield of the C47. Another episode of Gearbox 2.0. This one's a live stream, kind of bouncing back and forth between recorded content and live stream content. Sorry about being out of breath. I just ran back from the house. A lot of stuff going on here today. Uh, water treatment people coming out. Conference call with a client in less than an hour. Uh, new episode of Cameron Flask later today. And uh, that's exciting stuff. So it's, uh, it's a good Wednesday here in the Pacific Northwest. Weather is nice. Feel free to say hi over here in the chat. And hopefully we won't run into the technical issues we ran into last week. Though my Wi-Fi hotspot has been a little bit funky, I think I got it up and running, and uh, here we are. So let's just say that with the Mueller hearings here in the United States of America, that I'm not necessarily expecting tons of people to be attending the chat today. Uh, but if you are here, please chat. And let's get the conversation going. So this is kind of a follow-up to last week's episode where I uh, started to talk about some of the stuff that was key travel kit or gear that pretty much goes with me all of the time when I am doing uh, production. 100% of the time, not 100% of the time, but it's pretty much the go-to stuff. And... Um, that generally changes over time because I will, uh, I'll find that, at least for me, that as a new piece of kit comes into the rotation, then some stuff starts to go out of the rotation. And, uh, and that's just the way it goes. So it looks like some people are showing up. Maybe uh, Mueller has said the same thing too many times. And so you guys are getting the gist of everything, and uh, I'm going to watch those things on replay later on today. So as I said, uh, today is really about Key Travel Kit Part 2, so it's a follow-up to last week's episode, if you didn't get to see that. Uh, the bad bits have been cut out because there was some technical issues, so you don't have to suffer through that. I did a little bit of uh, trimming to the video. And uh, say hello in the chat. What's up, Daniel? Nice to... See you here. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you guys a book. Um, I like showing you guys books because they help us learn our craft, especially the really good ones. Now, there may be a new version of this book, but this one is Dave Vieira. It's called Lighting for Film and Electronic Cinematography. So you guys can see that. This book is exceptional. I would say that this is near the top of the list for me in terms of books related to the craft of cinematography. Um, I love it because it's so visual, it's well written, and there are many, many versions of this book. Many of them are very expensive. If you go to the c47.com and you go under the gear section, is that what I call it nowadays? I'm going to tell you right now. Da, 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 da. Let's see what I call it. I call it, come on, I call it gear. Equipment. Under equipment, you just go to books, and it's listed there. Uh, so go check it out in the book section. Bill, how are you? Hey, Andres, nice to see you. Um, good. Yeah, check out last week's episode, Andres, also, because I talk about key kit that I'm using. And we have some people here, so it's time to start talking about travel kit. As always, don't forget that you can ask general production questions during any episode of Gearbox 2.0, and I'll do my best to answer those questions. Um, a little bit of a crazy day. We're not going to go for a full hour because I have a conference call at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, but let's jump into it and talk about some key travel gear that pretty much goes with me all of the time, and as I said before, it changes as new stuff comes into rotation. So save the audio stuff for later. Um, let's talk about camera support first. Now here's the first thing that goes with me pretty much everywhere. Um, this little monopod from Suray. It's the P-326. It is just a monopod. 
this head here is separate. Um, and basically the way I travel with this because it collapses down to about 15 and a half inches in terms of total length is it just sits on the top of um, one of my rolling bags or a check bag. And this thing is a beast. Um, carbon fiber uh, goes really, really high, high enough to get shots with. And the really cool thing is that if you just get a shock mount, it's a portable shock mount for your microphone when you're out on the road. Now, how do I mount that? Uh, generally, obviously it just extends here. And what I will do is I'm going to show this to you. Another very favorite piece of kit for me. Sorry, I'm moving a lot of crap around here and the AF is going wonky donk. Um, if you've ever watched Gearbox, if you've ever watched Camera and Flask, anything having to do with grip, you will know that I am extremely partial to the mini grip head from Matthew Studio Equipment. And it is a uh, basically a composite plastic version of a standard grip head. And then I absolutely love these things here, which are called mini Mathalini clamps. So they're small Cardellini or Mathalini clamps. And you use these together and I use them for reflectors and things like that. But <clears throat> if you're just doing a quick setup here and you want to actually mount this as a boom pole off of a stand, then all I would do basically and you just have to deal with the noise because we're in production. I would basically just clamp this sucker here and you, you can see that this would basically be mounted to this on a grip head, I mean on a light stand, and then basically I have a little audio solution. So if I'm doing a sit down interview, very, very compact. Um, the other part of this, and I, again, I really apologize because I'm turning here and the AF system is going bonkers um, is let's go ahead and take a look at this little video head here. Now I used to use a little video head from Benro, which was Arca Swiss compatible. Um, they stopped making that the SH2, I believe it is. And they still have it as a, as a regular video head. So I found this from Sure, and it's called the VA dash five. I love this thing. It is a fluid head, really small fluid head, um, ideal for little mirrorless cameras on the go. Great when you're using it with a monopod, but I also, <laughs> wait, hi, Jim. Worth mentioning that bed bugs are on the rise and remember that when one organizes and handles bags on planes, hotel rooms, no joke. Okay, Henrik, I will remember that. Uh, and I'm going to watch out for the bed bugs. Maybe we should be bringing something for bed bugs. I don't know. Um, I travel with a, usually with a portable tripod as well. This one is from Benro and it is called the Pro Angel FPA 29A. I don't know if they still make this model, but it's incredibly compact. Um, it's definitely tall enough with a camera system for standups and this is an aluminum version. I don't know if they now make a carbon fiber version, but I really love that. Uh, let's see who just said hi. Slotko, nice to have you here on the live stream. Um, okay, this is a new acquisition. I wanted a tiny little Arca Swiss compatible tripod for going to the UK in August. And this one is made by Newer. You've heard of Newer with two E's. I'll probably replace this with this Sure head when I go on the road. Uh, but what's kind of nice about this is it can do little tabletops when I'm in Scotland and it actually extends. Check that thing out. That's bonkers. Uh, even this extends just a wee bit. Um, but this is a little portable, really portable tripod. Um, I would consider this <clears throat> more of a tabletop and just for, you know, photography type applications. Um, I'm digging it. Wasn't expensive. I think I paid 30 bucks or something, 40 bucks for it. So there you go. There's that. Um, I'll try to put links to this uh, stuff after I'm done. Other grip kit that I really love to travel with really, again, um, you can't go wrong with having a couple of, uh, Israeli arms, articulating arms, because they come in handy when you're trying to rig stuff. 
So, you know, get one or two of those, probably one if you're trying to keep your kit small and you're trying to keep it lightweight. Um, the other thing that I love are these little nano clamps and there's a lot of different companies who make them. This one is made by Monfrotto, but there are other companies impact and things like that. And what I generally do is I line the inside with um, Velcro, the soft part of the Velcro. And that basically makes sure that when I'm clamping to things, I'm not damaging the surfaces. A lot of farming going on outside. So if you hear any noises, my apologies. That's what happens when you're in the country. Then I have a quarter 20 to 3 8 stud. And what I'll do is I'll attach that to probably my favorite ball mounts in the world that I know of, which are the Monfrotto 492s. Strong, reliable, um, and they're really great. And then I usually just travel with it with at least a quarter 20 to 3 8 bushing so I can step that up if I need to for some piece of kit. These clamp to everything. I usually have at least a couple of those. And then I also have these other little baby pin adapters. They make these in 3 8 and also quarter 20. I have both. And what you basically do is you say, hey, look, I want to put a light on anything uh, that's using a 5 8 stud. So you basically put that onto the end of the 492 and you have something to rig that to. So again, just stuff that you can easily travel with. Um, I put them in, as I showed you last week, <clears throat> generally for the most part, I put them in these little packing cubes and then that way I can see everything, especially grip equipment, which is, you know, hardcore, strong stuff. All right, more stuff over there. Uh, Zlatko has the Sockler 75 legs. Do you mean the Flotex with the Monfrotto Nitrotech 8 head or just uh, other ones? What's up, David? Welcome. Glad you made it. Um, hopefully this is a little more interesting than the hearings, though the hearings are important here in the States. Now this is my little makeup bag. Um, there's a lot of stuff inside of here, like rice powder and uh, kabuki brush and you know, uh, brush cleaner and all that kind of stuff. It's all in here. Um, but I'm only going to show you one thing. And I'm only going to show you one thing because it's the thing that I use almost all of the time when it comes to taking shine off. And it is this stuff from Matt, uh, I mean Mac, uh, M-A-C. And it's this Matt, and they call it Creme Matefiante. Uh, I'm sure I'm saying that incorrectly. I'm making it sound like it's Italian and it's really a uh, French product. And I travel with these little wedges here. You can buy those in pretty much any uh, pharmacy or place like that. Slotco, that Flotech is awesome. And this stuff is about $25 to $30 US a bottle and or tube. And basically what you do is you put it on the wedge. Usually I just put it on my hands for me. And then what you do is you just apply that. And what it does is it takes the shine off. And it is absolutely a magnificent product. And what I love about this particular product is that even when you start sweating outside, you can't really see the sweat. So you might feel or your talent might feel uncomfortable, but what you're seeing on camera is generally fine. And it's a quick walk in for a touch up, uh, especially on the T here. But I would have to say that uh, David's like a bad penny that always shows up. Hey, that's not a bad thing or turns up. Um, so that particular stuff is golden. It really is the lifesaver. We were actually in Atlanta recently for 10 day production. That stuff was in heavy rotation for the main talent for that. And then I showed it to the talent's wife and she started, because she was on camera, applying it over her makeup because it's safe to apply over makeup. Um, that stuff is secret sauce stuff for production. Make sure you get a tube of that. Okay, so now I think, and again, I'm open to any production questions, so feel free to jump into the chat. Don't forget, link is at the top of the chat. There is uh, another episode of Cameron Flask coming up today at 3 p.m. Pacific, and we are talking about gear fads, video gear fads, part one. 
we're starting all the way back at what I consider, Caleb considers, uh, I would say Ben would consider the beginning of the fads, which were 35 millimeter lens adapters. And then we're gonna go forward timeline wise. So make sure you tune into that. Again, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. British summertime. Uh, speaking of politics and stuff going on over there. And also over in the Czech Republic, Ben will be joining us as always, uh, and this time he will be at midnight in the check. What's the name again? The name of what Hongji? Wu? Uh, do you mean the makeup stuff? Um, if it's the makeup stuff, then it's made by MAC, M-A-C. It's right here. It's the matte creme uh, matifiante. Again, I'm making it sound like it's Italian, but... That's because I'm half Italian. And I don't know how to do anything that relates to even a resemblance of a French accent. So what's up, everybody? How's everybody doing? Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about some other key stuff. So I talked about some grip stuff, uh, you know, monopod, some, you know, really small stuff to hold up stuff. Too much gear will distract from actually filming. Slotko, I agree. Um I keep my kit very small. In fact, just to kind of discuss a little bit about what I'm traveling with nowadays, when it has to just be a production that's related to just me or me and one other person, um, the camera system is generally either the C200, which is over my left shoulder over there, or it is the X-T3, which I'm using right now for this live stream. And the kit that I'm using primarily with the X-T3 is I'm using a, a travel tripod, which I showed earlier on in this episode, along with a little small video head. Um, I have some gear that I kit out. I don't generally cage it unless I'm doing something uh, where I have to have a lot of GAC on the camera system. But what I'll almost always have is the little small rig handle on there, which if you look back in the archives, uh, I show kind of how I'm rigging out the camera and you can see those handles and I have a couple of those. And what I like about that handle, even though I don't love cold shoes, is it has two cold shoes. And on one of the cold shoes, I have the five inch focus monitor from Small HD. And um, I'm using that for two reasons. I'm using it for monitoring reasons when I am outside and inside because it gives me a much larger screen. It gives me Small HD's OS, which gives me you know, scopes, expanded focus, false colors, um, all of the things that you'd want in terms of tools, uh, assist tools when you're actually filming. 800 nits, so it's generally good for outdoor shooting. But the key to the castle for me on the focus monitor, which I have, again, hooked up over there right now, is that they have dummy battery solutions for virtually all camera systems, now including Fujifilm. So what I have is I have a uh, basically, a, you know, an NPF, Sony NPF compatible L-series battery on the back of that focus monitor. And I don't even have the monitor on right now. Um, I'm actually just using the monitor to power the X-T3, which gives me much, much longer battery life for the camera system than if I was using the small battery inside. Uh, I am 800 nits, Caleb Pike. There he is. Super, the golden boy. Um, so that's how I'm using the X-T3. And then I just travel with a few lenses. I've got the 35 F2, which is rather resistant. That's what I'm using right now. I have the 18 to 55 kit. It's a 2.8 to a 4. And then, um, and then I have the, um, the 56. And the 56 is really just a lens that I travel with for photography. It is not... Uh, video lens. I'm excited about the 16 to 80 that they just announced. The F4 uh, straight through, that's going to be your basically 24 to 120. And that's going to be really uh, a killer. Um, I know you do. I know you do, Caleb. Um, Lab Rat's going to be in Glasgow. Uh, I won't be far from Glasgow. I, I grew up in the borders region of Scotland. So I'll be in the Peebles area, which is where I was born, Lab Rat. Uh, so we'll see. Maybe we'll get together for uh, coffee, maybe something a little bit stronger. We'll see how things go. 
Daniel's asking how many lights do I usually travel with? One man band here. Daniel, I usually travel with just a few. And when I say a few, most of those lights are smaller. In fact, if you check out last week's episode, I do talk about a few of the lights that are pretty much in my kit all of the time. Those include the Luxley Viola, the Luxley Cello, and um, I just recently, though I've used it before, acquired and bought a, uh, an F7 from Aperture. So those three little guys take up no room, also run off of Sony NPF style batteries, which are ubiquitous, easy to get. Um, and basically, um, that's the deal in terms of that. And then when I am traveling with a larger light, it's pretty much always going to be a one by one or a one by two flex light from Westcott because I can get a lot of output. It takes up almost no room in the kit. Uh, generally traveling with version one by colors because the control is a little smaller, but I'm getting in the new DMX controller that doesn't have Wi-Fi, which is much smaller for the system. So I'm excited about that because Flex 2.0 is more robust. Uh, the cabling is better and that will bring the whole kit down. So that's gonna be awesome. And I love the new system. It's very modular, very expandable. Uh, but to me, the whole thing about flexible LEDs is the portability of them and being able to go everywhere for them. Um, Andre says, for video, I just started using the Power Junkie, which is uh, from Blindspot Gear. With my EOS R, it's fantastic. I even run my Mix Pre 6 with it and still have a USB uh, port free for a light or anything else. Yeah, it's great. Um, yes, Peebles is nice. It's very picturesque. And... Uh, that's what it is. It's like a postcard town uh, with a little, you know, it's good. It's nice. Okay, so do I use a locking video monopod? Uh, Bill, I don't generally use a locking video monopod. I have in the past, if you mean the one that have the three feet at the bottom that can lock down. Um, I'm not opposed to them. I do like them. Uh, there's actually some new stuff that I have in, uh, in the barn from Sue Ray that I'm going to be talking about soon. I'll probably do that when I get back from the UK at the end of August. Man, I have so much stuff to get into and through with the things that I have. Okay, so any other questions on that stuff? I think we're doing okay. Jem, what's your media storage solution? SSD or HDD? What if you have more than 10 terabytes of footage? Uh, Hon Hongji Wu, um, what's up, Shiz Nuts? He's back. Oh my God. That that brought a smile to my face. You better be in the Cameron Flask uh, conversation later today, by the way. So Hongji, uh, media storage. So when I travel, I don't have it in front of me here. Um, I, I basically just figure out how much we're going to be doing in terms of production. So for me personally, I'm generally traveling with a two terabyte SSD uh, RAID Zero solution from Glyph. So it's their Atom uh, SSDs, and I love those. They're incredibly fast, uh, Thunderbolt uh, compatible three, and really, really fly for sure. Um, but when it comes to just sort of standard production, what we're generally doing is we're traveling with uh, USB-C uh, 3.1 drives, because I'm on a MacBook Pro, and I'm buying four terabyte drives and I always buy them essentially in pairs so that I can do uh, an offload and then a backup, an offload and a backup. And generally what we'll do is we'll walk at the end of the day with separates of that. Uh, on this last job I did in Atlanta, the other thing that I did is I picked up a 10 terabyte, um, not bus powered, but uh, plug-in powered uh, GTEC drive. And that's basically where all of the footage from those other drives went at the end of the day. So we essentially had a third backup happening at the end of the day. So that's the deal. Um, congrats uh, on the new camera, Shiznuts. I have not tried the G7X Mark III. That's the one that was just announced, right, I think? Um, and it does YouTube live streaming, which is pretty awesome. Good. Um, and then, uh, Hongji, just to bounce back to that, we also have a RAID here, which uh, has even higher capacity. And I also have a bare drive uh, dock where I have 12 terabyte drives that I can drop into there. In fact, we're uh, actually doing a backup today. The person who's working on this post project 
uh, with me is doing a backup, probably as we speak, back over there uh, so that we can back up what's been worked on so far up to date. Um, Daniel's renting the EOSR right now, like it a lot. Yeah, a lot of people love the EOSR. It's the standard Canon thing, right? Um, it sucks, it sucks. They don't give us features. Start using the camera. Oh, it's getting the job done. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't want those features. It just generally, they work. Uh, they, they have good color science. They get a lot of stuff done overall. Uh, David says, I saw the new Aperture promo video for the 300D2. Love their solution for mounting the control box. They call it the lightning mount, I believe. Uh, to the stand, I had to use a super clamp with a stud for my 120D2. David, that 300D2 looks bonkers. Uh, they really stepped it up in terms of a V2 of that fixture. I have the 300D. Uh, great fixture, but definitely left much to be desired in terms of the overall workflow and that extra fan and everything else. I think the biggest thing for me is that it's a silent fixture. So you've got 20% um, more output. Use that reflector. You're getting even more, even more because it's intensifying it. And, uh, and then you start taking that Bowens mount, silent fixture, the spotlight that's coming out, all of their modifiers, all of the Bowens modifiers. It's awesome. Now I want bicolor. But we know they're going to probably jump from vibe color to RGB. We'll see what happens. That's the next. Uh, that's the next horizon for chip on board is working out the whole thing where it's really color tunable. All right. Um, Aperture always nails it. They used to be the no budget brand. They sure are getting pricier. Then again, the industry standard is way above that. So I guess they still are more affordable. I would agree. I mean, look, the reality is, and let's just get down to business here, kids, is as a company grows, they grow. And as they grow, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> they need to, I've said that enough times, they have expenses. So there's R&D, right? There's production costs. Um, but then there's employees and there's rent and there's all of the things that need to exist in order for a company to be able to hopefully uh, give us good customer service. And somewhere along the line, um, there's a make break point in terms of manufacturing cost and running a company of whatever size that is, which is the realities of doing business as you grow. So you can keep it small and nimble to a certain extent, but at a certain point, again, there is a breaking point in terms of cost of manufacturing and how much impact that can have on the overall cost of your product. That said, um, the 300D was supposed to come to street at $1,199, and they actually came to street at $1,099. And for what that fixture is and how they've designed it and all of the things that are there, um, I still feel that it provides tremendous value for what you are getting out of that fixture. And I'm very excited about uh, using it on productions. In fact, it's, um, it's on my want list. Okay, so ever use the Toshiba Xeria Pro SDXC cards? No, I'm actually pretty partialable. Partialable, it's not even a word. Ridiculous. I am partial to the Angelbird uh, SD cards right now. Um, I'm using them with the Fuji Film X-T3. I like that they do these things called match packs. I don't know if it's a marketing gimmick or not, uh, but I like the fact that they're testing them in the camera. They're saying that you know those are, are specifically for the camera. Obviously, they're SD cards. You can format them for something else. But the idea is you're buying media for your camera system, and they're reasonably priced, and I have been happy with them so far. Um, good. What else do we have here? All right, I got some more kit to talk about, and I probably only have about another 10 to 15 minutes in this particular episode. As I said, check at the top of the chat. There is a link to today's camera and flask. It's going to be video gear fads, and I am excited about that. Um, what else am I going to show you? Well, I love using these little Tenba bags here along with my these cubes, basically. Shut up. Uh, that's a reminder for my call. 
And again, these ones are actually even better than the packing cubes because these things, these tool uh, bags or whatever you call them, I have to figure it out. And um, these things let you see what's inside, but they are padded on the sides. And this is obviously an audio one. Um, <clears throat> here's another one that is a different size, which is an audio one. And speaking of audio, I think the first thing that we need to talk about is uh, Joseph's catching up at two times speed. Um, is this little sucker right here? Wireless Go. Um, it is in heavy rotation here at the C47. And it is not in heavy rotation for uh, client-based productions. But anytime I'm doing camera and flask, I'm doing gearbox, I'm running around, this is the thing. Now, what I'm doing is I'm currently using it with the Rode LAV. Um, I have a new LAV coming in soon, by the way, but it's going to require soldering iron and stuff. Maybe I should do an episode on that. We'll see. Um, and then I'm terminating here to the Micon 2 adapter, which is flat on the bottom and is basically a TRS, uh, you know, eighth inch uh, adapter plug that goes flush with the wireless go. They are actually, to my knowledge, making a dedicated lavalier for the wireless go, which will be great. 200 bucks for this thing. Um, I'm loving it. I haven't had a mic come out yet. And... I'm using it with the X-T3. So that's kind of like my go-to um, vlogging, live streaming, whatever you want to call it uh, thing. And then I just have a um, mini <clears throat> to regular HDMI cable that runs over here. And I've talked about the Cam Link adapter. And that basically just goes right into my MacBook Pro for the live streams. Um, Bill said, I designed the pouch for pouches as we discussed in the previous episode. Would you like, yeah, I'd love to check it out. I love the Inception pouches. I'm a pouch, so I'm a bag. I have a, a fetish. Uh, if you can have a fetish, um, well, many people do, but mine is bags. Like, that's it. If, if I'm obsessed and pouches and things like that, that's my thing. Um, yeah, I hear you, man. Okay, so... Uh, wireless go fits in this little pouch. It's nice and neat. Um, what else do I have in this pouch here? Uh, these little Tenba pouches. I think they still sell these. These are the ones that I keep a lot of audio stuff in here, double stick tape. Um, and the reason I have that is because oftentimes I'm taking a little wireless lav and hiding it into these little Sankin. I also have LMC ones. Let's see what else is in this little sucker here. There's another one that's black. And then I should, I have two of these pouches. So the other one is in another pouch. But I just keep little audio stuff inside of these little pouches. And it works really, really well. Um, if you need a name brand for double stick tape, here it is. It's called Top Stick. And you can just keep that in there when you're using those LMC and those Sankin uh, little adapters. I generally now travel with, because of my Sony uh, wireless lav system, I travel with rechargeable batteries. Um, I'm using the Panasonic's, the Eneloop Pros, and the charger for that. So I've done an episode on that. I don't really need to talk about that. And then my other pouch. Here it is. I don't need to show you everything in here, but there are a couple of things. Pouch for pouches. It is inception level stuff. It's almost meta, I guess. Uh, NT55, this is a cardioid mic. It has a, uh, a 75 and 150 hertz uh, roll off uh, in terms of a low cut filter. It also has a uh, attenuator. So you can basically lower the level of the input by 10 or 20 dB with those little switches that are there. And uh, this is kind of a go-to interior mic for me. And then the wireless system that I'm generally using is I'm using the Sony system here. Um, this is the dual channel receiver. And that means I can plug in two uh, microphones into uh, basically there or receive two signals. And I have two transmitters. And so that's kind of my wireless system overall. And I just try to keep all of this stuff in neat and tidy places. And yeah, it's focus breathing because of the autofocus. And uh, 
you know, this is a stills lens. This is not a video lens, this 35. Um, <clears throat> marsupials are starting to watch your, your channel now. Why? Because of the focus breathing? Yeah, that's probably true. So what else do I have? Uh, Audio-wise, I keep everything in those pouches because then when I get to the airport, um, my life is a lot easier because pretty much anything that's larger than the cell phone is supposed to come out now. So what I do is I just line up like four of those buckets, uh, those trays, and I just take everything out in the pouches and just load them up and I just let them go through the line, which is a little scary because it's all out there, but you have to do it. Um, video micro, for sure. This thing is inexpensive, sounds quite good, and if I'm traveling with a little mirrorless camera, then that's going to be inside of the kit. And then from a headphone standpoint, um, my go-to has always, well, not always, used to be the 7506s, but my go-tos are these, which are the Sennheiser HD25s. Absolutely love them. Flat frequency response. They are quiet uh, in terms of noise, not canceling, but noise reduction. So the, one of the reasons that I don't love the 7506 and the 506s, and I own two pairs of them is that I'm not uh, a, a trained sound recordist in the traditional sense. So they're very open ear and there's a lot of ambient noise that bleeds into what you're hearing. And sometimes it's hard for me, even though I have good hearing, to basically differentiate between the ambience and what the mic is picking up. These HD25s are um, apparently originally designed for people to wear on Concord. This is well before noise canceling headphones existed uh, with the white noise that they have right now. And they, they basically tune out a lot more of the ambient noise so I find it much easier to identify when I'm hearing audio problems. Now, on the not opposite side, but in terms of keeping things really small, I'm also a big fan, partially because of design, but partially because of sound, with these little um, guys here, which are called the Porter Pros from Koss. They're very 80s. Um, you can get them in a, a few different ways. And I kind of look like, you know the character. Come on. You guys can figure it out. Return of the Jedi. Um, come on. Somebody say it. Bald. Looks like that. Dustin says airport travel is brutal for that. You need to get TSA pre for sure. Yeah, tell me about it. Um, speaking of that, and speaking about the TSA, I actually have these locks as well, but they're TSA approved. And so they can put a key in here and F with your stuff, which they like to do. But I do, when I'm checking bags with equipment, at least like to have a lock on there so you can get those. Are they really going to do anything? Probably not. But it gives me just a little teensy-weensy more peace of mind. Uh, Cloud City guy. Come on, David. You know the name. You can do it. Here we go. Should I do it one more time? Let's see. People are Googling now. Um, it's not pretty, but I have a beard now, so I can't really pull this off the way I used to be able to. But come on, Lando, Lando, come on. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. There it is. You got it, Lobot. Uh, just traveled with TSA Pre for the first time last week, and I can't believe it's taken me so long to get it. it was a breeze. Sam, it is a breeze, but that depends on what airport you're in. Um, if you actually live in a large city uh, airport, uh, doesn't even make any sense. If you live in a city with a very large airport, uh, let's say Los Angeles or New York, then TSA Pre is actually less effective. Yeah, sure, you don't have to take your crap out, but the lines sometimes for TSA Pre are actually longer than they are for regular. Uh, costs, Porta Pros, oh yeah. So they sound good, you know? They're great little headphones and they're not expensive. So I think that that's my list for today. Is there anything else? Ba, 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 that I want to talk about. Uh, well, I didn't say this last week, but generally because it takes up no room, and I'm using actually these little pouches for hard drive. But guess what fits inside of there? Perfect is the passport color checker video uh, right here. So that can fit in pretty much anything, and I like to protect it a little bit. It's a good thing. Um, Shiznuts just got Privium at Amsterdam Airport. 
I don't know what that is. It sounds like in Amsterdam that could be anything. I'm just kidding. Similar thingy to the Netherlands quicker through everything. That's awesome. Um, saw a guy get his drone confiscated at Mexican uh, in Mexico customs. That sucks. Traveling with uh, equipment is not fun sometimes, and it's getting more and more difficult. And uh, I don't love doing it. But domestically, it just means getting to the airport a little bit earlier and having your stuff together. Uh, putting everything in pouches and things like that makes a huge difference because when you get to um, security, it's just so much easier to take everything out and lay it inside of a bucket or a tray in something like this. And if you've got five or six of those, between the two bags of varying sizes, the pouches and stuff, they just all lay in there and they basically put stuff from one bag in one tray, another bag in another tray. And then I generally put my bags in front of those trays so that when everything comes through, I can start to pull stuff and put them back in there. Um, I also feel like when I travel and I go through security that I'm doing more work than the TSA people are because I wind up, because I have to pack my stuff, I wind up actually having to stack all of the trays to keep the line going. It's ridiculous. When I travel now um, with my roller and my backpack, it almost feels like it does when I was traveling with my wife and uh, two or eventually three kids and going through an airport and how long it takes for everything to come out of the bags. And that was before the days of anything larger than a cell phone. So that was just because we had strollers and we had, you know, all of the other things that have to, you know, go through that. Um, <laughs> I live back in the Netherlands, hashtag beach life. Um, I don't know if that's actually beach life, but okay. But I still work from Vienna. So to save myself security hassle, I have premium for priority check-in and security. Sounds like a plan. I like Vienna. I have a very good friend in Vienna who I need to catch up with, my step twin. Um, okay, good. So any other questions, any other comments that are general production questions? I only have a few minutes because I have to get ready now for this conference call with a client. Um, again, let's just say that this is kind of important. That's your camera and flask link for today at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central, where Mr. Caleb Pike is and also at 11 p.m. British Standard Time uh, and midnight over in the Czech Republic. Um, she's nuts. I don't feel bad for you right now. And you told me you just got a new camera, but you have a 180 degree view of the North Sea. So I don't know. Zlatko, you're very welcome. Hopefully uh, you got some tips and you learned something from this episode and you also have experienced the flutter focus of the X-T3 when it is not in record mode. Um, Guy, I apologize profusely. I actually called you yesterday. I did get your email, and I do want to talk to you about those lights. I was just wondering if it made more sense for me to talk to Wayne about them, because um, I did check them out at NAB, and I don't want you to send out a light that uh, is coming out of your inventory. But let's get on the phone in the next few days and chat, Guy Cochran. Um, and what else do we have here? Daniel, you're welcome. Uh, David, do I have... Uh, oh, that's a question for Shiznuts. And good. And Shiznuts, I, I'm not even... This is getting in... We're just come to the Cameron Flask uh <laughs> live stream later today. We're talking about video gear fads and we're starting from that transition of uh, small sensor, half inch, well, one third, half inch, two third inch chip cameras and how we started to move into getting a selective focus cinematic look from those cameras and uh, where it all went from there. Today, Caleb is our host and it should be fun. And I'm not reading any more of what's in the chat. I thank you very, very much for showing up and being here at the live stream. More than likely a recorded episode next week, but no promises. Let me know if you're interested in particular topics. You can go to the c47.com forward slash contact and just submit a form there. And, uh, and David has some nasty gin ready to go. 
Uh, I'm excited. Last week I was at the school, so I couldn't have a drink. I was drinking water out of this, and it's still water, but there will be something of an alcoholic beverage ready then. And I'll see you guys all in, oh, I don't know. It's uh, five hours and change, and Shizna should probably open up again. I can't read this stuff because, uh, well, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching Gearbox, and don't forget to subscribe.